26. Matthew chapter 26, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 16. Let me also mention, as Pastor Matt has earlier today, that we'll, he and I, Pastor Matt and I, will be switching duties <clears throat> next Lord's Day for a few Sundays as uh, I will be leading the adult uh, education class. We'll be dealing with a, a very important issue on covenant theology. <clears throat> and uh, it's been a while since we've been through this teaching, but we'll begin that, and Matt will be bringing, I believe, more uh, more messages in Kings, first, uh, Second Kings, which uh, have been very, very uh, illuminating, enlightening, and just uh, challenging to to my heart. This morning we'll be looking at Matthew chapter twenty-six, verses one through sixteen. If you're using the Bibles that are under your seats, <clears throat> you find it on page 831 and 832. So let us now pay heed to what the Lord says to us from His inspired, infallible Word from Matthew 26, 1 through 16. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, He said to His disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. <clears throat> now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. This is the living, infallible, inspired word of God. May he add his wonderful blessing to it as we handle it this morning. Shall we pray together? O oh Lord, our God, who has called us with a holy calling, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. O Lord, our God, we would indeed plead with you today to grant to us a heart of understanding, a heart of focus, so that we would come to this text, we would approach a time in the life of our Savior that is filled with pain and sorrow, and that we would grasp its spiritual and its eternal significance. Lord, let not a familiarity with this <clears throat> sacred and hallowed account, let it not find our hearts uh, calloused and unresponsive to the truth, and let not a familiarity with our Lord's passion cause us to ever be unresponsive to the truth. So may your Spirit do His special work in His special way in our hearts and in our minds. In these moments we pray, in the name of Christ our Lord, who died and who rose again. Amen and amen. After a hiatus of two years, we are back in Matthew's Gospel. I think we've done several installments going back probably to 2012. Um, but you see how rich this gospel is. Uh, we just can't speed our way through it. 
But our goal uh, is to finish our exposition um, of this very amazing gospel, hopefully before the Lord returns. And, um, and we will do that if the Lord is pleased. Now, our last message, if you recall, two years ago, which I'm sure you all do, was uh, on Matthew chapter 25, that last segment there, verses 31 through 46. And, and we, we discussed the habits of the one who's ready for the coming of the king. And I was thinking about that as uh, Pastor Matt was leading us in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, especially of being prepared for the coming of the Lord. And that, that text in Matthew 24 and 25, known as the Olivet Discourse, that was our Lord's last public um, teaching. And he taught on the coming of His kingdom in power, uh, in the power of the Spirit. So today we want to begin what is often typically, commonly called the passion narratives of the gospel. These are the events that uh, lead up to the arrest and then the trial, uh, the crucifixion, the death, and then the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So hostility against Jesus is now... Uh, dramatically shifting from verbal confrontation to outright uh, concrete action. And what we find in verses 1 through 5 is Israel's leaders. They now determine that it is time to do away with Jesus. And we're told uh, that Jesus has finished all his sayings, which probably points to the, the end of his public teaching ministry. <clears throat> Not uh, just perhaps uh, what he last taught on in the Olivet Discourse. Because from this point on, Jesus will have no extended public instruction that we've come to see in the five discourses up through <clears throat> this point in Matthew. Now note in verse 2, that Jesus alerts the disciples that Passover is near. Notice after two days, which would be the day after tomorrow in real time. Now, it's not apparently clear if this refers to Nisan 14. Nisan would be the first month of the Jewish year, roughly corresponding to our March, April. The Passover lambs were slaughtered in the afternoon of Nisan 14. And he could be referring to that or could be referring to the Passover meal that was eaten on the following day on Nisan 15. And when we get to verse 17, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the time when our Lord observed uh, that last Passover meal that he had with his disciples. But here for the first time, we are seeing uh, Jesus' death is linked connected with Passover, and that has great theological significance, and we are to grasp that the death of Christ is, is what everything before that was pointing to when it came to the Passover. So Jesus' death is not just another human passing from the scene. Now verse 3, we get wind of the chief priests and the elders as they come together at the house of the president of the chief priest, which is Caiaphas. And the purpose of this <clears throat> called meeting is to come up with a covert way to not just arrest Jesus, but to put him to death. We see that in verse 4. So it's clear as these leaders meet that they are not concerned with any kind of real justice because they already have the result predetermined in their mind. All they want, all they need is the right opportunity to put their hands on Jesus. And they don't want to risk angering the crowd of uh, pilgrims that have swelled the population of Jerusalem at this time. And they've just been enthralled by Jesus. They don't want to anger them because they held him to be from God a prophet. They don't want to risk a riot and enraging the Roman authorities. We see that in verse 5. So the leaders have their plan. It's beginning to take shape. 
But Matthew wants us to know, wants us to be very clear that though the leaders may have their plans, ultimately it is God who has his plan. Jesus alerts his disciples right from the very start that he is going to be crucified. The leaders have their plan, but God has his plan. And then Matthew shifts in verses 6 through 13 now to an episode involving uh, Jesus while he's staying in, at Bethany, which was considered a vicinity of Jerusalem. And he's at the house of a man named Simon the leper. And what this incident does is it shows us a stark contrast to the hostility of the Jewish leaders. He's at, home, at the home of, of friends. And it's while at this place in verses 6 through 13 that an unnamed woman extravagantly anoints Jesus. An unnamed woman extravagantly anoints Jesus. Now there are several things to notice here in this, in these uh, verses of Scripture. Uh, first, Matthew, he doesn't tell us who this woman is. Because who has done it is really not the, the important thing. What's important is to whom this action has been done. This ointment, this perfume that she used was very expensive. Mark, in his gospel, he tells us that it was worth a year's wages. And when she breaks the, the vial and she pours it over Jesus' head, verse 8, the disciples of our Lord are indignant. They're incensed. They're outraged. I mean, they're not just miffed. They're not just a little peaked. They are outraged and very, very mad. And they bawled this lady out big time. You know, during the Passover feast, giving alms to the poor, that was a major a feature of the Passover. It was something that everyone did. It was expected. And so they reasoned that this woman was being nothing but wasteful in what she was doing in using this expensive perfume. Uh, myrrh on the head and body of our Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus responds, and his response has struck some people as very self-centered. And, and probably if we're candid, we'll admit thinking, well, I know it's Jesus and all, but really, don't the disciples have a point? But Jesus is not focused on self-gratification. It's, it's the significance. It's the meaning of what's behind what this woman did that he commends. And, and he even, get this, he even elevates what she did to be remembered whenever the gospel is proclaimed. Those who were familiar with Roman crucifixion knew the, the sheer dishonor and indignity that would be shown to Jesus in denying him a proper burial. And one thing we need to understand that a proper burial was very, very important to the Jew. They understood the importance of the body even after, especially after death. The woman had heard Jesus say, she understood that he would be crucified. She knew what that meant. She knew it would mean humiliation. It would mean indignity, dishonor, mockery, and shame. This is her Lord. So in her mind... Nothing was too extravagant. Nothing was too expensive to show her honor and her love, her devotion to Jesus. She was anointing, as we see in verse 12, she was preparing Jesus for burial. Now, guests that came to homes in that day were frequently anointed with oil. But this anointing was special. It was done and pouring over the head and uh, uh, using it on the feet. It was special because not only of the expense, but um, it was done 
fitting for kings and priests. And instead of being wasteful, Jesus said that what this woman did, verse 10, was beautiful, was lovely, was excellent. There wasn't anything untoward or wrong or wasteful in what she was doing. Uh, there will always be an opportunity to help the poor. But right now, this was a defining moment in the history of the world. Jesus was headed to the cross. And helping the poor had to take a back seat at this particular time. Once the events played out, the needs of the poor would again be front and center. Now notice Jesus said that wherever this gospel so right there tells us that he is placing his crucifixion in the category of good news. Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. So Jesus is envisioning a worldwide movement. What she has done will be told in memory of her. Now what this woman did, it was not itself a part of the gospel. But what she did shows the response of faith and love that the gospel calls for. I wonder how many of us would waste a year's wages on Jesus. Most of us would not. And it's not that you're called to do that. After all, the gospel is not, not about what you do for God. But what this woman did came from her heart. Heart of faith. And in hearing the gospel, people also need to remember there is nothing too extravagant or wasteful when it's offered to Christ Jesus. Now, there's a third preparatory aspect in the scheme. We've looked at two of them. The chief priests as they plot in this woman's anointing of Jesus. The third aspect is somewhat disheartening. Because here in verses 14 through 16, Jesus' own disciple now plots to betray him. Jesus' own disciple plots to betray him. This is Judas. And again, this doesn't take Jesus by surprise. He's not caught off guard. He knew from the very beginning that Judas would betray him. I mean, Judas, sometime prior to the Passover, we see he approached the chief priests. He asked them what they will give him, verse 15, if he hands Jesus over to them. And they agree, in verse 15, on 30 pieces of silver. After that, Judas looks for the right moment, the right occasion to turn Jesus over to the authorities. And so now the leaders... Their plan has been given a boost. They have an inside man to help them with their plot. Now, traditionally, Judas has been called the traitor. And that's with good reason. But recent scholarship in the past few decades has uh, worked hard to soften that assessment of Judas. And many scholars wonder, you know, how in the world could someone give so much of his life, so much of his energy, his time to the cause of Jesus, and alter that whole course of his life for a relatively small sum of money? See, it just doesn't make sense. 30 pieces of silver certainly wasn't chump change, but it wasn't the amount of money that um, someone truly greedy would readily accept to betray someone that was close to them. And so today what you'll see often are certain dramatic portrayals of Judas that will paint him as um, um, really an innocent, disillusioned, well-intentioned follower who thought that he could... Uh, avert Jesus' crucifixion by preemptively turning him over to the authorities. And once he learned that the authorities would kill Jesus, he had great remorse such that he killed himself. 
But the gospel accounts do not give us any cause to see Judas for other than what he was. One who wickedly betrayed Jesus. Now, no, no doubt was there were underlying reasons that led him to oppose Jesus, but he knew they were not legitimate. And whatever the reason, when Satan entered the heart of Judas, this disciple had given the devil the key to his heart. And forever he will be what he is, the betrayer of Jesus. So let's not fall... Um, let's not fall for any of Hollywood's preposterous and blasphemous sentimentalism. So here we see the plot to kill Jesus taking shape. Told by Jesus to his disciples, preparing them, these important events, significant events, the unnamed woman, Judas. How do, how do we go about even applying this, seeking meaning for our lives? Now, there will certainly be things in these chapters that we incorporate into our lives. I mean, it has to have meaning. This isn't just bare history that's being told so that we could talk about something that happened a couple of millennia ago. But neither should we think that Jesus went to the cross, that he suffered the, the agonies of death just so that we could make a couple of uh, applications and points and lessons for getting us through the week ahead. The focus is on Christ. Everything that we have looked at previously in Matthew, even even in Hosea, even in Kings, everything has been leading up to this point. This is the focal point of history. It's bringing us to see the horror of the sacrifice of our Savior. But also to see the glory and the power of His triumph. So we observe how the Jewish leaders they had enough of Jesus. And now it was time for action. They had to silence him. They had to get rid of him. But, of course, they, they needed to make it look respectable. Had to do it in a way that uh, wouldn't cause them to lose their power or prestige or esteem in the eyes of the people. And there's a matter that we see very prominently in these verses, and it involves the, the matter of leadership. And those who are entrusted with the reins of, of uh, authority and, and power. Leaders are supposed to serve and to protect, to guide the ones that they lead. They're called to, to um, uphold what is right and to condemn what is wrong. It's a it's a serious responsibility, one that represents ultimate authority in God. Now understand that the Jewish leaders, the priests, the elders, they had their plan, but they were ultimately acting according to the plan of God. And we find that the disciples came to realize this very clearly after Jesus rose from the dead. And speaking of the leaders who crucified Jesus, the, the first followers of our Savior, as they were in Jerusalem and as they prayed together, and their prayer is recorded for us in Acts, they prayed this, truly in this city there were gathered against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Those early followers of Jesus were very staunch, firm predestinarians. And it tells us something about leadership. 
Even though leadership is, is something that we may not be called to, in one sense, in our lives, we are at times both a leader and, and also a follower in our different roles, in our different capacities, in our different relationships and so forth. Here we see leaders were the ones that instigated, on a human level, the plot to kill Jesus. Leaders who were supposed to reinforce and buttress and promote the truth. If anyone should have known that Jesus was Lord, it should have been these chief priests and elders. They should have known. They had the evidence right at their fingertips. If you're a leader, if you're one who exercises power and influence over others, whatever capacity that might be, parent, teacher, boss, supervisor, influencer of some kind, Understand that God will hold you accountable for how you wield authority, whether you do it for good or for ill. These leaders in Israel were held accountable. All leaders. All those in authority. Teachers are leaders. That's one reason why James said, let not many of us be teachers. Why? Because there's a stricter, higher condemnation that accrues because of those in positions of authority. And yet God calls His people to authority to represent Him. God will hold you accountable for how you wield authority. We ought to lead and we ought to govern and we ought to Guide in the fear of God. Be on our knees constantly before the Lord. Grant me wisdom. Isn't Solomon such a wonderful example early on in his life when he realized just how weak and how childlike he was and the great prayer that he prayed for wisdom would that he had stayed there in that mindset. And yet so often when those get in positions of authority and power and the accolades and the privileges pour in, it's very easy to become corrupt. Now, if you're one under authority, and really we all are, in one capacity or another, there's a flip side of this, that God will also hold you responsible to respect that authority. And if that authority is abusive, and I mean truly abusive, not just doing something you don't like or disagree with. Then the Lord will hear your cries for justice. And He will bring that about in His appointed time. We need to respect authority. Yes, human authority will fall short. There will be abuses. That's when we need to cry to the Lord for justice. And He will hear those cries. He will answer in His appointed time. You and I, we should seek justice when it's not forthcoming. But if it isn't forthcoming, we need to wait and rest in the Lord because He's ultimately in charge. Now, there are extraordinary circumstances where tyranny may be put down. But it must be done in a way that recognizes legitimate lines of authority. We've talked about this before. No, no reason or need at this point to go into any further. And also, I just might want to say, this does not mean that one must remain in a truly abusive situation and put himself or herself in harm's way. Say with a spouse or something along those lines. But here I'm speaking mainly about the civic realm and our duties as citizens. One of the reasons why we have bad leadership is because of God's judgment. We need to pray for our leaders. In the civic realm, in the spiritual realm, that God would be gracious. And it could very well be the Lord will call you to be such. But perhaps a major item to consider is this unnamed woman. She doesn't get the airtime that she should. This unnamed woman whom 
John, in his gospel, he identifies her as Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And we so often ignore the account of this woman who anointed Jesus. Or, or if we do uh, take note, it's, it's a curious anomaly, or we view it as some sentimental gesture from an emotional woman who probably was penny wise but pound foolish. But Matthew wants to focus on the act, not the person. Her response of faith is all important. It's, it's all about Christ, the object. It's not about the woman, although she is to be remembered and to be commended. This woman could not, think about it, she could not bear the thought of her Lord This was someone who had touched her family deeply. She could not bear the thought of Jesus being dishonored or crucified in the way that he would be. Those crucified were considered to be criminals. This woman knew that Jesus was not a criminal. He was the very antithesis of any kind of malefactor. So when all the others in the house were just incensed over this perceived waste of good ointment, Jesus, He steps in. And one thing we learn from this is that nothing is ever wasted when it's done to honor Christ Jesus. There's nothing ever wasted when it's done to honor Christ Jesus. And so in this instance, a woman, and as far as we know, a single woman, someone whose family probably could have used the proceeds from the sale of this expensive, luxurious myrrh nard, this woman spent it not on herself, Not even on her family. But she poured it out. She spent it on her Savior, on her Lord, to honor Him for burial. And as a result, Jesus wants what she did to be remembered along with the gospel. Why? Because she did it by faith. Faith that works through love. A love for Jesus and what His death would mean. And that is the response of the good news. Verse 13, this gospel is to be proclaimed in the whole world, and this response of faith is what is demanded. What is your faith? What does your love cause you to waste on Christ? And then isn't it shocking to behold Judas. We've probably heard it so much that it's, yeah, that's Judas. What do you expect? But here was a man who had close, intimate contact with Jesus. He witnessed the miraculous things that Jesus did. He himself was even empowered along with the other disciples to perform miracles. Judas! Judas heard the wisdom of the Lord firsthand, sat at his feet, heard it coming from the lips of Jesus. To think that this disciple would ever take part in a scheme, in a plot to betray Jesus is unimaginable to silence him. But you know, as far back as chapter 10 and in our trek through Matthew. Remember when Matthew recorded those names of the uh, apostles when Jesus called them? He alerted us right from the very start to to Judas's role as the betrayer of the Lord Christ. And so despite all of the efforts to rehabilitate Judas, to make him less onerous, more human, He will be forever branded a traitor because that's what he was. I mean, whatever the human motive that Judas 
had. Even though he was a recognized disciple of Jesus, granting the ability to perform miracles along with others, despite all of this privilege, Judas rejected Jesus as Lord. So, you know, among so many things we can learn from Judas as being enrolled as one of the 12 disciples, it does seem very clear, does it not, that we should not be surprised. We should not be thrown off of our spiritual progress. Whenever we witness someone who falls away from the faith, who once just seemed so rock solid in the faith, and when they commit terribly egregious offenses against Christ. It's shocking. It's difficult. It's hard. It's grievous. But yet we shouldn't be surprised or shocked. We've been told. We've been warned. Jesus told us, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That there will be many, many, many who say to Jesus on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. As much as we would wish or pray for, you know, that everyone who professes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as much as we would wish that it would be, it would be a true, solid profession, Never waver from it. You know, the Scriptures, especially, particularly the New Testament Scriptures, show that not everyone who is a member of the church, not everyone who's a member of the New Covenant, is truly a believer in Christ. Some are self-consciously hypocritical about their confession. They know they don't believe. For whatever psychological reason, for whatever reason, they want to profess. But there really isn't a love and a belief in Christ. Not really to submit to His Lordship. Or maybe for a time, but even in the parable that we see our Lord told about the sower. It's temporary faith. And when there's trials, tribulations, problems, well, then you really see where their faith is grounded. That's why we should rejoice in our trials and tribulations. Why? Because we're seeing whether or not we're the real thing or not. Some are self-consciously hypocritical, but others are deceived. Or they mistake what a true belief in Christ means. Or they're not really trusting in, in, in a true gospel. That's why Paul anatomizes anyone who would preach another gospel. Another gospel of, except the one of grace. Believing in Christ alone. Through faith alone. And of course... We still realize, though, we need to treat, view, consider anyone who professes faith in Christ to truly be one of the church, a member of the church, a member of Christ. Until it may happen that the gatekeepers, which are the elders of the church, on solid evidence, declare someone stripped of that title and put out as a disciple of the Lord Jesus, as a believer in Christ. We are unable to read hearts. Ultimately, only the Lord God knows the heart. The Lord set His seal on this. The Lord knows who are His. Several prominent professing Christians, as of late, 
have either renounced the faith or committed such sinful acts that it calls into serious question their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Seems like almost every week I read an article about someone, many of whom I've never even heard of before, but other people have, that they are deconstructing their faith, rethinking the faith, supposedly to get away from the judgmentalism and the hypocrisy of Orthodox Christianity, but it's not long until essentially there's no faith in Christ at all. Now some may repent and return. When we come up in the gospel a little bit later on, we'll see. You know, Peter betrayed Christ. Peter! One of the pillars of the church betrayed Christ. The outcome and the result between Peter and Judas couldn't be more stark. Some may return having repented. Others may truly apostatize, fall away from the faith to a point of no return. And you and I, when that happens, we should be grieved. But we should not be shaken in our faith. Because Christ has told us it will happen. So the plot was devised by the leaders of Israel. And Judas gave this plan a boost. Became the inside man. But the most momentous event in all human history was taking shape through this plot. The most momentous focal point of all human history would take place. And it would not be remotely even a product of human devising. It was all of God. The chief priests and the elders, Judas and others, they all had their motives, they all had their reasons. The back of it all is the sovereign, divine plan and direction of Almighty God from, who from all eternity purposed that the worst crime in human history would take place upon His beloved Son. And so just in a matter of hours from now, in, in this text, a small, it's just a small slice of human history. The most momentous events of all would occur. Within hours, Jesus will be dead. The enemies of Jesus would win, right? Wrong. Jesus knew it was happening. The plot to kill Jesus took shape just as it was supposed to do. You know, I have to confess that after coming to Christ in faith, being led to bow to His Lordship in my life as imperfectly as that occurs. I have just always been very um, reticent, loath to, to go back to these events, to revisit them, these events that have led up to the death of our Lord Jesus. I don't like to think about how he was treated. How he was betrayed. Arrested as a criminal. He's mocked. Spat upon. Whipped. Beaten. Tortured. He was put on a cross where his joints would be severed. His muscles would convulse. His lungs would be crushed to the point of asphyxiation. And that was just the physical part. Even more devastating. And, and 
I don't know that any of us can truly wrap our heads around this. Even more devastating was the union and the communion that Jesus the Son had with the Father as it was severed. When the full wrath of His Father, the judgment of God for sinners, was poured out upon the innocent, sinless, perfect Son of God. The hymn writer Stuart Townend put it so well. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Do we really need to go back and remember and think about what happened to Jesus when he went to the cross? Most assuredly we do. We need to know that if not for the grace of God, we are Judas. We need to know that only by the grace of God can we be this unnamed woman who in the midst of her sorrow poured out extravagant love and devotion and did a beautiful thing. Indeed, the plan to kill Jesus took shape. Because the plan to make you and me the sons and daughters of God also took shape. Remember the unnamed woman. Because when you do, you remember the burial and death that Jesus Christ Endured for you. O oh, holy, sovereign Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What would we waste on you, O Christ? What would we waste to bring you honor in the midst of a world that heaps scorn and shame upon the one who gave us his life as a ransom for many? O oh, Father, enable us always and ever to behold your deep, deep love for us, we who are your people, for whom you gave your only Son to make wretches like us your treasure. And may the sufferings and the agony that we revisit again in this passion narrative, may it touch hearts, may it stir emotions, May it reach minds, minds of those yet outside of Christ. And may they see the pain and suffering that Christ endured because of sin. And may they flee to Him as the one who makes clean and whole. For it's in the name of our Savior and Lord Christ Jesus that we pray. Amen. I know we sang it last Lord's Day. At least you did.